Hello, Academy Journalers, and welcome to this Entheos Academy class on how to take your journaling practice deeper. My name is Hannah Braim. I am a coach, a writer, and a journaling enthusiast. I run a website called Becoming Who You Are, which you can find at becomingwhoyouare.net. And on there, I talk about self-kindness, self-care, journaling, creativity, and everything in between. So if you feel inspired to check it out after watching this class, please feel free to go ahead and do that. So as I said, this class is going to be on taking your journaling practice deeper. So if you've been journaling for a while, if you know you maybe been doing your morning pages or sitting down with your journal each day or on a regular basis most days, this is the place to be. This class is going to be perfect for you. If you're new to journaling or if you're returning to journaling after a bit of a break, uh, totally go ahead and watch this class by all means. But what I'd also invite you and encourage you to do is to go back to another class that I recorded, which is called How to Start a Regular Journaling Practice. And that really covers the foundations of journaling. You can totally use this class with that class, use them both concurrently. Um, but yeah, I'd also invite you to go back and watch that just because that covers some basics, which will really get you started. As I said, really give you the foundations to start a regular journaling practice for personal development. So before we get on to talking about these 10 big ideas, which really are going to be 10 techniques and suggestions that you can use in your journaling practice, um, I want to spend a few minutes exploring why. Why do you want to take your journaling practice deeper? Why would we uh, want to explore that? So journaling is it has many, many benefits, as you probably know if you're watching this class because you've probably been doing it for a while. So I'm not going to go back over all of those today because we've got a ton of stuff to get through anyway. But what you'll probably find is that when you've been journaling for a while, you might start to notice yourself getting into certain patterns. You know, it becomes quite familiar, it becomes quite comfortable, and that's a fantastic time to stretch yourself a little bit, to take your journaling in a different direction, add in a few new ingredients to the recipe, and see what comes out of that. Um, you know, with any process of growth, we go through periods of stagnation and then periods of growth. And adding new techniques into your journaling is a fantastic way of provoking a new period of growth and getting that started. So that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Ultimately, taking your journaling deeper will give you greater self-awareness, it'll help you dive deeper into your authentic expression, and it will help you consciously create a more meaningful life, which I think you can agree is something that we all want, a more meaningful life. So let's dive straight into those 10 big ideas. Big idea number one is revisit old journaling entries. So this is a great way of using journaling that you've already done as a springboard for new journaling entries. Help to take your journaling to a deeper level by going back and looking at things you've written previously. It's a great way of observing patterns, changes, and similarities that maybe we missed the first time around. Often when we're journaling about something in the moment, we're very involved emotionally. You know, all of the stuff that we're journaling about is gonna be really fresh for us. So sometimes with that hindsight and that emotional distance and objectivity that comes from leaving some time, we can observe you know, new insights, new epiphanies, and those patterns, those changes, those similarities that I talked about that we might not have seen before the first time around. The question that people always ask me when it comes to revisiting old journaling entries is, how much time do I leave between actually writing the entry and then going back? You know, how much time is enough time? And it's really hard to give a definitive answer to that because it's such a personal thing. So it's going to depend on two things in my experience. First of all, it's going to depend on you. And when it comes to you, there's absolutely no right or wrong amount of time to leave. However much is the right time to leave for you, that is perfect. Um, so you might find that perhaps you can get that emotional distance and can get that objectivity fairly quickly, like maybe a few days after, maybe a week after. If that's you, that's totally cool. Um, you might find that you need to wait a bit longer in order to get that different perspective, and that is also fine. The other thing that will influence how long to wait is where you're at in life, you know, what's going on. And what I found is that when I'm in the middle of long-term situations or challenges or things that are quite emotional and quite intense, 
I need to leave more time between doing the journaling and going back and revisiting just because it takes me longer to distance myself emotionally from the situation and longer to get that objectivity. So for me, and again, this is just the guideline, you know, I say that caveat that it's really, really up to you. So experiment and play around with it. For me, I usually wait at least a week between journaling and revisiting my journaling if I'm kind of looking at my day-to-day -day stuff. Um, if it's something that's a little more intense, if I'm kind of working through particular challenges, processing stuff, I will usually wait um, sometimes up to a couple of months, depending on what it is, depending on how I'm feeling about it, um, just to yeah get that distance, get that objectivity, and really to be able to view it with fresh eyes. So in the meantime, you know, we're going to have accrued more wisdom, we're going to have had different experiences, we're going to have different information that we're working with. So yeah, we'll be able to go back and look at those old entries with new perspectives. And even though we're looking at writing that we did as a sort of previous version of ourselves, we're still going to gain more self-awareness about ourselves in the present. So that is big idea number one. We visit old journaling entries. Big idea number two is to write a love letter. So this is not any old love letter. It's not love letter in the traditional sense. It's actually, it's got a bit of a twist on it. So it's actually a love letter to yourself from someone else. So this is an idea that I got from Jennifer Pastelov, uh, who is a yoga teacher and a speaker from the States. I went to a workshop that she ran in London a few weeks ago, which was a yoga manifestation workshop. And it was really fabulous, a really, really great mix of yoga and journaling, just really, really powerful experience. So if she's ever in your area and running a workshop, I highly recommend checking her out. But she offered this journaling tool and it was super, super powerful, really empowering, really affirming. And, you know, so it moves so, so many people. So I wanted to share it with you today. So basically for this, what you need to do is just close your eyes and envision someone who really, truly loves and accepts you. So this might be a partner. It might be a family member. It might be a friend. Um, it can be anyone. They also don't have to be someone who is in your life today. It could be someone who's living, someone who's deceased, um, someone from your past, anyone at all. But the most important thing is that they really embody that person for you. So someone who really, truly loves and accepts you for who you are. And just spend a few moments with your eyes closed, letting that feeling wash over you. So really experiencing what it's like to be loved and accepted by that person. So just take a few moments, let it wash over you. Think of that person in your mind's eye and really notice the physical sensations that are coming up as you think of them, loving and accepting you for exactly who you are. And then when you sat with that for a few seconds, open your eyes, open your journal and start writing a letter to yourself from the perspective of that person. So this is a really unique experience because it's so rare that we get to experience that feeling of being truly loved and accepted by someone. And it really gives us an opportunity to feel what that's like. And at the same time, to view ourselves from the perspective of that really loving, accepting person's place, you know, to view, to view us through their eyes. So maybe you want to write a general letter to yourself, just a really sort of kind, supportive letter from that person. Maybe you want to ask for guidance about a certain question or issue that you're struggling with at the moment. The focus is really, really up to you, you know, but just think about, you know, what advice, what wisdom would they have to offer you in this position where you are right now? So moving on to big idea number three, which is tap into your oldest, wisest self. So this is pretty similar to big idea number two. It's another letter, but again, we're writing it to ourselves from a different perspective. And this time we're writing it to ourselves from ourselves in the future. So we're doing a little bit of time traveling here. <laughs> so the way I think about this is it's my 90 year old self. And I'd really encourage you to think about an age for you that really symbolizes wisdom. So maybe that's 60, maybe it's 70, 80, maybe it's even younger. 
But when you think of yourself at your kind of oldest, wisest peak, um, imagine that age. And again, just sit, close your eyes for a few moments and think about how that version of yourself feels about you today. You know, imagine them looking back all these years later and thinking about you as you are right now watching this. Again, let that feeling wash over you. Just really experience what that feels like. Um, and just, yeah, experience it. Sit with whatever that feeling is, whatever you think they might be feeling about you, however, they, however you think they might view you. And just, again, touch into those physical sensations, register what it feels like, and stay with that for a few moments. And then when you've really felt that, again, you can open your eyes and begin writing a letter to yourself from the perspective of this older, wiser version of yourself. Similar to the previous big idea that I shared where you're writing a love letter from someone who really loves you and accepts you, um, this is a great way of acknowledging and recognizing your own resourcefulness right now. You know, quite often we look externally for answers to situations we're struggling with, uh, questions that we might have, things that are quite uncertain or difficult. But what this exercise is really helpful for showing us is that we usually have all the resources that we need and all the answers that we seek. Um, you know, they're usually inside us. So this, again, is a really good opportunity to think of a question or a decision or a situation that you're really grappling with right now. Or um, on the other side of the coin, you know, think about something that's going really well and think about what that version of yourself, that future 90-year-old, 80-year-old, whatever version of yourself would say to you today about that. What wisdom would they share with you and what can you take away from that and use in your life today? So big idea number four, lists of 100. So lists are not typically associated with journaling, but they are a really, really useful tool, um, especially if you enjoy using them in your kind of day-to-day -day life and find them really helpful. They're really great for organizing our thoughts, exploring possibilities, dreaming big, and having fun as well, which is super important. They're also really, really helpful when we're busy, when we might not feel like we have a lot of time to sit down and maybe do, you know, stream of consciousness journaling, morning pages, that kind of stuff. So lists are a really, really good tool to kind of keep in your pocket for those times when you're feeling a bit stretched, but you still want to check in with yourself. So they don't also have to be lists of 100. I like to stick to 100 just because it's a nice big round number. And the idea of it is that you stretch yourself as well. Um, for you, that might be a list of 50, it might be a list of 500, depending on what you're writing about. But you want to choose a number that's Big. You know, it's not necessarily a number of items that come easily to you in your mind. It needs to be something that requires creativity um, and, yeah, requires you kind of to stretch yourself and really think and dig deep. So you can do a list of 100 in stitching, or it could be something that you carry around with you and just kind of fill out when you're waiting in line or, uh, I don't know, on the bus or the train, <laughs> whenever you have a few moments whenever kind of inspiration pops into your head, whenever you feel like it, you want to check in with that list and see how it's going. So ideas of lists you can do, um, so, so many possibilities with this. Um, here are a few of my favorite. I, have, I really like experimenting with lists of 100 places to visit, uh, lists of 100 people to meet, lists of 100 things to try, which you might also know is sort of a bucket list or a life list, um, lists of 100 things that bring me joy, 100 ways I can to take care of myself, and also getting quite meta, a hundred lists of things that I can make, a, hundred, a list of a hundred things I can make a list of a hundred about. Wow, it's quite hard to say. <laughs> but you know what I mean. It's like a way to play around, um, have some fun, you know, and take your journaling deeper through journaling. So that's big idea number four, list of 100. Big idea number five is writing with your non-dominant hand. So I'm offering up this suggestion with the caveat that if you're ambidextrous, this might not quite have the same effect for you, but that's totally cool. Um, try it anyway, maybe experiment writing with your less strong hand, see how it feels. Um, but yeah, this is a really great suggestion for people who are either you know, singly right-handed or left-handed. And it's often used by creative therapists because what it does is it reminds us of that formative time when we were kind of learning how to write, when we weren't yet 
uh, very used to communicating through writing. You know, as adults, we often forget what that feels like. We're so used to speaking. We're used to being able to write anything we want, whenever we want. But writing with our non-dominant hand kind of takes us back to that time when we weren't, when we didn't have that method of communication. It's often quite a challenging, you know, definitely rewarding, but a challenging and frustrating time for a lot of us. And for a lot of us as well, with the way that curriculum works in school and the way that kind of we were developing as kids, it's also a time when we were forming a lot of our beliefs about the world and the people around us. So what this exercise does is it really helps us tap into a part of our personality that psychologists call our inner child. Our inner child is basically part of our personality that, um, depending on who you talk to, some people might view it as sort of being stuck in that time. Um, I sort of hesitate to use the word stuck because I think that sort of has a few connotations for us. But it's basically a part of our personality that acts or reacts based on childhood experiences. So through these experiences, we develop beliefs about ourselves and about the world around us that at the time we needed to survive. So as kids, we developed this whole set of beliefs that were really, really helpful to us then. And what a lot of us find is that, you know, some of these beliefs carry on being helpful when we grow up and become adults. But there's also another portion of beliefs that stop being so helpful. And writing with our non-dominant hand, because it takes us back to that time, can help us process, you know, why we form those beliefs in the first place, and also unpack, you know, whether or not they're helpful to us now. They develop our awareness about how we might be still reacting to these beliefs that aren't helpful to us anymore, and what we might want to do to change that. So, as well as offering the suggestion with the caveat that if you're ambidextrous, you know, try it, see how it goes. Um, I would also say that if you know that you had quite traumatic experiences during childhood, be really gentle with yourself and take care of yourself. And you might want to consider doing this exercise with a counsellor. So that's big idea number five, writing with your non-dominant hand. And that can be like regular stream of consciousness journaling. You can write with your non-dominant hand about a particular issue that you're working on. Um, you can use it with all these other techniques that I'm talking about as well. It's a really, really flexible uh, journaling technique that you can apply to loads and loads of different situations. So big idea number six is have a conversation with your inner committee. So what is your inner committee? Basically, when we think about ourselves and our personalities, we like to talk about ourselves and think about ourselves as a whole. But actually, if you really pay attention to the thoughts that are going through your head, what you'll probably notice is that there is a multitude of voices in there. That doesn't mean you're crazy. You know, we often talk about people having voices in their head as being, it's kind of a pejorative way of describing someone, but actually it's a sign of health if you're aware of what those voices are. So that's what we're talking about in this big idea is embracing the voices in your head because we all have them. Even if we're not super aware of them, we all have this internal dialogue. One way of tapping into this and sort of thinking for yourself about or starting to explore for yourself where your own internal dialogue um, might be on the different characters that you might have is thinking about a time when you felt resistant to doing something. So a classic example of this is getting up in the morning to work out. You know, Maybe it's winter, maybe it's dark and it's cold and your alarm goes off and you wake up and part of you is like, right, time for action, <laughs> time to get those workout clothes on and get going. And then at the same time, there's another part of you that's like, oh, but it's kind of cold and it's raining outside and you know, I'm, I'm pretty tired after yesterday. Maybe I could just hit snooze and I have like 10 more minutes. And this usually sets off a little bit of tension between those two parts. And you might hear the, the first voice responding, no, you really need to get up and do this because maybe you didn't do it yesterday or maybe you committed to doing it a certain number of times this week and you know you're gonna feel better afterwards. And then the other voice starts bargaining and justifying all the reasons why you really don't have to do it today and it's okay, you'll be fine. <laughs> so we've all been there, you know, whether it's about exercise, whether it's about um, food choices, any new habits that we're trying to instill, this sort of resistance usually pops up. So that's a really great example of our internal dialogue. And often noticing those times is a really great avenue into exploring all these different characters that we have in our head. And journaling is a fantastic way of doing that just because it creates a safe space 
for us to explore the, all these different voices and not only develop our awareness of them, but also negotiate conflicts between them. So a classic voice that most, if not, I'd say probably all of us have is the inner critic, right? We are all familiar with the inner critic. Um, whatever it sounds like to you, usually it can be pretty mean. It's not something we particularly enjoy encountering. And, you know, usually we think about it as something that we kind of want to get rid of or want to ignore or shut out. But actually, you know, something I really encourage you to think about as a perspective as you're journaling with these bits of your internal dialogue is that all parts of our internal dialogue have a purpose, right? They are all working for us in their own way. They all have their own set of beliefs. And usually the inner critic is kind of motivated quite a lot by fear, you know, fear of rejection, fear of failure, and uh, a lot of ego-based fear, basically. Um, so in its own way, even though it can be really mean, it can say really harsh things, it can leave us feeling really kind of down on ourselves, really affect our confidence, it's trying to protect us in its own way. So that's, I really encourage you to think about it in that way as you're going in to journaling with these parts of your dialogue. Because when you think about it in that way, you realize that it's not a question of shutting your inner critic up or um, shutting it out or ignoring it or kind of stamping it out, calling it names or whatever. It's a question of negotiating with it. And what we can do with journaling is we can hear these parts of our internal dialogue and at the same time we can set boundaries with them. So we can start a conversation with our inner critic where we can you know, maybe even write out, I would really love to hear what you have to say. I'm gonna need to ask you to stop calling me names and I really need you to tone down your language. And can you try and say what you need to say in a way that's as kind as possible? And just see what comes up. You know, it might sound really simple to kind of make that sort of request, especially if you're used to really battling it out with your critic inside your mind. But writing things down, externalizing them, getting them out of our heads is super, super powerful. So you can have this kind of conversation through journaling with any parts of your internal dialogue. As I said, it's really great as a safe space for negotiation. So when you kind of get a little bit more used to it, um, in the beginning, we really encourage you not to overthink it, just write whatever comes into your head. But as you get more used to it, something you can start doing is almost writing it like a movie script, including um, giving each part names. So you might wanna give them names of people that they remind you of perhaps, you know, because as the saying goes, um, I'm not gonna get this exactly right, but as Jim Rohn said, you know, we are the sum of the five people that we spend the most time with. So sometimes we can recognize certain people, you know, especially parents or uh, really prominent childhood figures in our internal dialogue who might say exactly the same things they used to say. So we can give them those names or, you know, I have an inner critic, um, I have an inner cheerleader, uh, I have an inner hippie as well, <laughs> um, so I also call my inner dreamer. So you might want to give them more adjective based names as well. It's really up to you. But when you get used to what they sound like, you can always start writing out the dialogue like a movie script and just use your journal as a mediation tool for negotiation. What you'll find is that the more you practice doing it on the page, the more used you'll get to doing that negotiation internally off the page too. So moving on to big idea number seven is write an unsent letter. So unsent letters are super, super useful for processing unfinished or unresolved business. And there's two really key reasons why they are unsent. That is the most important part of this is that they are unsent letters. So the first reason is because they're not for the benefit of the recipient or the recipients. You know, if you are writing to you know, an organization or something, whatever it is you feel like you need to process and whoever it is you feel you need to process it with. But they're not for the benefit of the recipient. They're for the benefit of you doing the writing. And the reason, the other reason why it's really, really important that they're unsent, which is a related reason, is because if we think there's even a chance that someone else might read this, we are far more likely to self-censor. And we're far more likely to not really be honest with ourselves about how we feel and what we think about this particular person or situation, which kind of defeats the object of doing this in the first place. So with unsent letters, they're basically a vehicle for us to express everything that we don't feel comfortable expressing or unable to say to someone. So it might be that, you know, we have, let's say, a professional relationship with someone, so maybe it's not appropriate to express everything we want to express. Maybe we don't yet feel like we have the courage. 
um, to express it. You know, it might also be that this person isn't part of our lives anymore. Maybe we've grown apart. Maybe we're not able to have that conversation with them now. You know, again, maybe they're deceased. Maybe they're just not in our lives for a multitude of reasons. But it's a really great way, you know, wh wherever this person was in your life and whatever role they played, um, whoever they are, you can still write them an unsent letter because it's not for them, it's for you. So once you've written your unsent letter, I'd encourage you just to, you know, again, focus on doing it stream of consciousness, really let out whatever needs to be said, whatever you want to express to this person, and then leave it, just sit on it for a while, and then come back to it. You know, as I said in Big Idea Number One, it's a great way of digging deeper into our journaling entries and kind of really mining for the gold in them is to revisit old journaling entries, and you can totally do that with this one as well. So come back to it. And with that emotional distance and that additional insight, um, check in with yourself and see how you feel rereading it now. You know, how do you feel about this situation, having had this chance to express yourself and having gained that emotional distance? You know, does, any, does it change anything for you? Does, it, does anything really stand out for you? And also, you know, as with all journaling entries, no pressure to take action, but it's useful to explore. Like if you were to take an action based on what you've written, what would that be? You know, is there anything you'd like to do as a result of what you've written? So that's big idea number seven, write an unsent letter. Big idea number eight is record your dreams. So dreams are super cool. I love them. <laughs> I think they could take up a whole class in themselves. But if you're someone who's sitting here right now thinking, well, I don't dream. Um, what I would say to you is that you probably do. It's just that you don't remember it right now. And that's totally okay. You can still use journaling to help that process along and to start, you know, remembering fragments or at least remembering that you've had a dream, even if you don't remember what it was and kind of build up the process from there. So this part of the class is still for you, even if you are convinced right now that you don't dream. Let me change your mind. <laughs> so dreams are fantastic just because they are metaphorical treasure troves of information and us processing information. They're a great way of our minds to process the past, the present, and the future. So when it comes to, if you're kind of starting from the very beginning and you're in a place right now where you don't really remember what you dream or you're, you're convinced that you don't actually dream at all, what I'd encourage you to do with this suggestion is just to start um, opening your journal when you wake up each morning and just writing down how you feel as soon as you wake up. If you do remember your dreams, this is also a really cool point to record, is how do you feel immediately after waking up from the dream? And how does that correlate to the dream? You know, is it like the complete opposite of how you felt during the dream? Is it related to something that you felt during the dream? You know, what are the first thoughts that pop into your head as well? So even if you can't remember anything, just make a regular practice each morning of just scribbling a few words down, um, literally five words about how you're feeling, any thoughts that are going through your head, and start there. And what you might notice is that if you open up this space to listen to yourself, you might start to get the sense that, oh, I think actually I had a dream. I just can't remember what it is. You know, that might be the first step. And then you might start remembering images or fragments or sounds or phrases might pop up for you. And, you know, that will be the next step. And if you stick with it and if you just open up that space to listen to yourself, eventually you will start to get either fragments of a dream or whole dreams and kind of open up a whole new world for self-exploration. So that's for you to start with if you are not sure whether you dream right now or if you can't remember any of your dreams, just start there. If you do remember your dreams, um, what I'd encourage you to do is almost write them down like a blow-by-blow -blow account as if you, you know, often in our dreams we're kind of witnessing things. Um, we're either involved in the action or we're witnessing it from a third party perspective. So write down whatever the case is, you know, give as much detail as possible. And then think back to how it relates to your life. So think about major events that are happening in your life right now. Think about um, what happened the day before. That's often really, really key or, you know, in the couple of days before. What conversations did you have with people? What were you thinking about? What really stuck in your head? Think about all these points and just think about how they might connect to the dream and how they might relate to what happened. Something else you can explore are the characters that showed up in your dream. So usually these either relate to people in our lives, past or present, or they relate to the parts of our personality that I was just talking about, so our internal dialogue. 
And this can be a really interesting way to connect this kind of journaling with the inner committee journaling that I was talking about in big idea number six, is to think about how does my internal dialogue show up in my dream? You know, what parts of my personality are there? How might they be manifesting in my dreams? So yeah, huge amount I can say about dreams, but I'll leave it there for now. Just start with a really basic exploration and see what comes out of that. See what you notice, see what um, unconscious, un con unconscious thoughts, you know, feelings and everything emerge from that. So big idea number nine is explore your leading roles. So we all play multiple roles in our lives. Um, these can be everything from you know, family roles like mother, father, sister, brother, daughter, son, uh, partner, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, neighbor, tennis partner, dog walker, <laughs> employee, employer, boss, manager. You know, All of these roles are roles that we find ourselves in at one point or another. And often we play these roles without even being totally 100% conscious that we are playing them. So each role, for us comes with its own set of beliefs, expectations, and responsibilities, whether we are conscious of the role we're playing or not. And sometimes we might be conscious of the role that we're playing. So, you know, I might be conscious of the fact that I'm someone's partner, but I might not be super conscious of the beliefs, the expectations, and responsibilities that I feel as a result of that. So journaling is a really, really cool way of exploring this and making sure that these beliefs, these expectations, these, and these responsibilities that we feel, maybe unconsciously, align with who we want to be and who we actually are in our authentic selves. So the way that we can do that is through using monologues for these significant roles. To start with, what I'd encourage you to do is just go through the next couple of days and write down all the roles that you notice yourself playing. So every time you're in an interaction with someone, um, think about like what was the role that I was playing in that interaction and is it a role that I'm conscious of playing normally in my day-to-day -day life? Then you know you can go back and think about how did I feel playing that role and um, that is a really good springboard for journaling. So how did I feel playing that role? Um, what would my ideal playing out of that role look like? And you know again exploring the beliefs, the expectations and some of the responsibilities that we feel associated with that role. So that's big idea number nine, exploring leading roles. Finally, moving on to big idea number 10. This is write your own eulogy. So this is not meant to leave you feeling <laughs> super depressed, aware of your own mortality. Um, I actually love this exercise and it's something that I recommend to a lot of people because what this is really, really about is it's about thinking about your legacy and gaining perspective on what really matters right here, right now. So when you write your own eulogy, um, try writing it from a third person perspective. So it's not about, you know, I, I did this in my life, I did that, because when it comes to our eulogies, usually we're not the people writing them, right? It's someone who's close to us in our lives. So maybe think of a specific person that you could imagine writing yours, or just, you know, choose a random third person perspective and write it from the perspective of someone talking about you, you know, at your funeral, memorial, whatever. And focus on the qualities, like focus on, you know, I, this person embodied these qualities, then focus on the experience that you had, and, you know, think about how you made other feel, other people feel. I think it was Maya Angelou who said, it's not what people, it's not what you do that people will remember, it's how you made them feel. So really think about, you know, how do I want to make other people uh, have felt during my lifetime? And what impact do I want to have had on their lives? You know, what legacy do I really want to leave? And when I say legacy, I don't mean that you have to leave, you know, a charity or a trust fund or anything behind, not that kind of legacy or a business or anything like that. But it's really about personal impact. You know, what kind of a life do you want to have lived? And then again, take a step back from that and think about how your life right now prepares to your vision of that legacy. Think about, you know, is there any action that you might want to take to align the two more, more closely. So spend, you know, as long as you need to writing your eulogy, as much time as it takes, go into as much detail as you can, painting this picture of what your life has looked like, the qualities that you've embodied, the experiences that you've had, the impact that you've made on other people, and then compare it to, you know, what's happening in your life right now, and use that as a springboard for 
taking that taking action and inspiration off the page and out into the real world. So with all of these suggestions that I've talked about today, you know, the great thing about journaling is that it's really, really flexible and really diverse. So with all of them, please adapt and personalize them to suit you and to suit what you're going through right now, to suit what you want to get out of your journaling practice. Notice what works, um, leave what doesn't work, you know, cherry pick the bits that work for you, leave the bits that don't. And remember that whatever ha is happening in life, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you can always return to a blank page for inspiration, for exploration, and for self-expression. So thank you so much for watching this class. I would love to hear which of these suggestions that you've just listened to resonate for you. So please feel free to head on over to the Oasis. You can find me on there and connect with me and let me know, or leave a comment underneath this video. So thanks so much for watching today and happy writing.